Good evening and welcome. It is a great pleasure to me uh, to be with you uh, tonight to commemorate the World Refugee Day. As you know, the 20th of June has been designated by the United Nations as a day, a special day during the year where we reflect on the fact that millions, but we are talking about millions of families has been displaced from home as a result of violence, as a result of war, as a result of persecution. And this is the day we, we honor them. We honor their resilience and their courage. As we know, we commemorate the World Refugee Day 2020 in very uh, special circumstances, the COVID-19 crisis, a global pandemic that is unveiling many of our vulnerabilities, but is also exacerbating a wide range of social, economic, and political inequalities. Here in the Philippines, the United Nations system is closely working with the government, civil society organization, private sector, humanitarian partners, towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals to ensure that no one is left behind. I just have a few days in Philippines, but enough to learn that uh, in the Filipino culture, uh, there is a long tradition of humanity that is the way that we blend compassion and solidarity. And the film that we'll be watching tonight is all about solidarity and compassion. So today we have to demonstrate all our commitment, solidarity and compassion with those that are suffering from forced displacement, from persecution and from violence. And this is a responsibility for all of us. So thank you so much for joining us in this World Refugee Day. Thank you. Warm greetings from UNHCR Philippines. I hope you have enjoyed the film screening and also learned how Filipinos have demonstrated empathy, solidarity, and inclusion over the years. UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, was born out of a powerful and shared conviction that we are all equal in dignity and rights, and that those who are persecuted because of their beliefs or characteristics, including their race, have a right to be protected. As of the end of 2019, 79.5 million were forcefully displaced around the globe. 80% are in areas affected by acute food insecurity and malnutrition, many of them facing new recurring and protracted conflicts and natural disaster risks simultaneously. We do not have to look very far to see displacement. Within our own borders, over 350,000 individuals are repeatedly displaced in Mindanao. UNHCR's priority is to stay and deliver for the refugees, internally displaced, and the stateless people. This World Refugee Day, UNHCR is appealing to everyone to help continue this global movement of solidarity and action. Everyone can make a difference and everyone counts when it comes to promoting inclusion, respect and the dignity for all, including refugees, internally displaced and stateless people. The world's displaced today needs us more than ever. I wish you and your family to be safe and strong to get through this all together. Maramin Salamapo. Maraming salamat. Thank you so much, Shinji, for your opening message. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, joining us from, from anywhere you are all over the world. Uh, my name is Ato Maraglio, and I'll be your moderator for this panel discussion. We are joined by an esteemed panel, and we are going to talk today about uh, our celebration of World Refugee Day and also to raise awareness about the situation of refugees and other displaced people around the world in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's my honor to introduce to uh, our panel one by one. Let's start with uh, our writer, producer, and director of An Open Door, award-winning filmmaker, Mr. Sonny Izon. Hello. Hi, Sonny. Hello. The next is a historian and co-producer of An Open Door, who is also a professor in New York who specializes in Philippine-American history, 
Multiculturalism and Film Analysis, Dr. Sharon Del Mendo. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And a descendant of Jewish refugees, Mr. Jack Simke. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Jack. We also have a historian and cultural heritage consultant who specializes in refugee history and worked on the history of the nine waves of refugees in the Philippines with UNHCR, Kina Kwan. Hi, good evening. So joining us from Giwan, Eastern Samar, is that right, Kina? Yes, yes. Kasama rin natin, a State Council and Protection Officer of the Department of Justice, Refugees and Stateless Persons Protection Unit, or the DOJ RSPPU, Attorney Paulito Orlito C. De Jesus. Hi, good evening. All right, maraming salamat. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in our panel discussion. Um, para simulan, to start our, our uh, discussion tonight, let's talk about the history of the Philippines as a haven for refugees, starting with the Jewish Manilaners from the film An Open Door. Unayin na po natin si Sir Noel, Sir Sunny. Uh, what was your inspiration behind making this film? Actually, I'm glad you asked me that because it's a two-part answer, if I may. The first inspiration was, had to do with, with the circumstances of my birth. I was born Liberation, 1946. And so all around me was the detritus of World War II. As kids, we, when we would play war, we had the real stuff. We had abandoned trucks, we had abandoned radios, bullets, the whole thing. And, and so as a child, it captured my imagination that something big happened. And I think as an adult, is, this became more of a, a somewhat like an obsession where I, I wanted to be part of that story somehow. And the way I did that was finally, when I went into television, I realized that I could look for stories that were not part of the mainstream, but that I could research and make into my own films. And that way I could be part of the story. And so that was the first initial, I think, impetus of making this film. You know, say around 2011, 2012, when we started doing some, you know, serious uh, research in, into it, that um, I found out that I had a much, much more personal connection to the story than I ever knew. You know, and you're a journalist and you know how some stories you have to look for, other stories they find you or they wait for you until you find them because they've been waiting all your life for you to find them. And uh, my father had always talked about this European man um, uh, who was a doctor uh, and his name was Zelesny. As I was researching and looking through the lists of Jewish refugees who got visas or were awarded visas to come to the Philippines, I saw his family name and the hairs on the back of my head just stood up. I, I was like, wait a minute. You mean the guy that knew my father and saved my father's life in 1945 when he was deathly ill and made my life possible? I was just all in a thousand percent. Once I found that out, it's, it's been just this driving motivation for me uh, to do something by way of thinking. Uh, the man who made my life possible. What was the experience like uh, making this film, especially since, like you say, it became a personal project? What was the most uh, meaningful and memorable experience or moment that stood out? There were very mo many moments, of course, in the process. You meet dozens and dozens of people. You make lifelong friends, you know. Uh, I've traveled to so many countries in the process of filming, research, as well as uh, film festivals. In one of those trips, uh, when we went to Warsaw, I went to uh, the town of uh, Wodzia, Lodz, in Poland. Uh, and uh, we went to uh, the site of a former concentration camp, as well as uh, the burial place of 150,000 Jews that were massacred there. 
and uh, I even saw the gravesite of the ones that were saved because they were getting ready to execute them when the Russians came and liberated them. And so it was really the first time that I was encountering my subject matter in a very visceral, emotional, non-intellectual level. And it was finally brought home to me um, when I was inside one of those transport rail cars that they used to transport them to the gas chambers. And I was just sitting there and, and just feeling the energy of this place. And I just broke down and I started crying. And uh, my companion, who is our Holocaust historian, Bonnie Harris, uh, she said I started crying out. I said, not, you know, never again, never again. We and she said, Sunny, that's why we're doing this film. Yeah, that must have been a very powerful moment in the film as well. Let me go to uh, Dr. Del Mendo and uh, ask you, given today's situation, why do you think it's important for people to, to see this film now? I think it's, this story is very important because it's really an unknown story. It's been lost for so long. And many years ago, when uh, Sonny called me on the phone, he told me about the Maniliners, and I had never heard of it before. And this is something that I hear every time I speak on this subject. People say, this is so amazing. Why have I never heard this before? Uh, and I did exactly the same thing the first time that I, that I heard about it from Sunny. I had been doing very extensive archival research on the Philippine Commonwealth US relations before, during, and after World War II, and particularly um, the structure of the Commonwealth and, and how that impeded Philippine agency over their own fate. Uh, and so I had done a lot of research at the National Archives in the US and had read hundreds and hundreds of pages. And nowhere in any of this had I heard at all about the Maniliners, about the Jewish refugees who, who found not just a place to escape the Holocaust, but a home. I think it's so important to tell it because it's not just a story of the Philippines and it's not just a story of the Holocaust. It's also a story of humanitarianism at work and Filipino hospitality when hospitality meant life or death. I have met so many of the Maniliners and their, their descendants and they have such an affection and a sense of belonging to the Philippines that lasts through the rest of their lives. I saw that come to fruition, fruition in the most profound way when Typhoon Haiyan came in 2013 and devastated parts of, of the Philippines. And the JDC, the American Joint Distribution Committee, ran a very energetic fundraising campaign for disaster relief. But in this particular case, they ran this fundraising campaign in the name of the Maniliners. And the the CEO of the JDC wrote a very impassioned letter that was published in the New York Times saying, the Philippines was there when we were in need. And now the Philippines is in need and, and we need to step up. We, we need to, to fulfill our utang na laob, diba? Uh, and this is something that I have seen translated down the generations and across the global diaspora. The Maniliners have absorbed the sense of Filipino utang na laob. At the same time that the Filipinos, in telling this story and in becoming aware of this story, have also absorbed the Jewish value of Tikkun Olam to repair the world or to heal the world. While I am a historian, and I'm fascinated by the story that the documents reveal, it's also very much about an enduring relationship that affects the present and also affects the future. The, now, the interesting thing is the guy that they sent to the Philippines to head up that relief effort was the son 
of one of the Manila nurses. Uh -huh. And so he jumped into that with a passion and people asked him, he said, why, why is this, you know, rescue mission different, you know, from all others for you? And he says, well, you know, I'm here not just to help, but I'm here to thank the Filipinos for my life. And the same with the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. They were one of the first ones to set up hospitals. And the first uh, Filipino couple that had a baby, you know, after the storm in that hospital, they named their firstborn Israel. And of course, uh, aside from the natural disasters that uh, visits the Philippines periodically, we are seeing a record number of refugees around the world. So this uh, is a good reminder of the kind of solidarity that uh, we should be giving all of these displaced families. Uh, I'd like to ask Sonny and uh, Dr. Delmendo, the World Refugee Day this year focuses on how every individual can make a difference. So what do you think is the message of an open door and how can it contribute to this kind of conversation? Well, let me expound first the response to open door around the world because I think it speaks to people understanding its message. Uh, we have won probably more than a dozen best documentaries around the world, but, but two in particular, one in Indonesia, a Muslim country, where we won the World Humanitarian Awards, and then one in, in uh, a former communist country in, in St. Petersburg, Russia, where we won best, best documentary. There is no real reason for them to be interested in this, other than that they were seeing the larger picture of this story, which is the humanitarian picture. This is the question that, that Open Door asks is, am I my brother's keeper? And I think our response is, yes, you are. We all are. If you go back to Nazi Germany and you have these instances where you have a, a knock on your door at two o'clock in the morning and you open the door, and it's a Jewish family of six, and you have two seconds to make up your mind. Do you let them in and risk your whole family, or do you shut them out and condemn them to death? And I think in our, you know, in our attempt to, to, to give a message, it is that we always open the door. Dr. Del Mendo, would you like to add anything? I think in the context of World Refugee Day, this is a very important story because President Kesson had enormous political and economic struggles to handle during the, the Commonwealth era. The Philippines was not a sovereign nation. The U.S. was still its overlord. And the Philippines was a, a relatively poor nation and one that had an awful lot going on. On top of everything else, the territorial aggression in the Pacific was coming ever ever closer to the Philippines and, and everybody knew it, Kassan knew it, everybody knew it. Um, and so with all of these issues and challenges to deal with, President Kassan cared uh, about the plight of people in Europe who were 6,000 miles away and he would never see. It is important for us today when we have record numbers of refugees all over the world usually from political situations, but in addition now we are beginning to have and will in the future have huge waves of immigration due to climate dis displacement. Uh, and that's something that is inevitable. And I think that the Manila nurse story shows that no matter how prosperous a country is, no matter what political challenges that country may be facing, even if the country is not a fully sovereign state, a country can still welcome people whom no one, no other place will welcome, and that they can become a vital part of the nation, the people, and that that, that will reap its own rewards simply by doing the right thing when doing the right thing is urgently, urgently needed.
So I think it's a good story to model humanitarianism for us now, everywhere. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Del Mendo. Now, Mr. Jack Simke is a descendant of the Jewish refugees in Manila. And Jack, I am so curious about uh, the experience of your family here in the Philippines. Can you share with us any of their stories from their time here? I'd be happy to do so. Um, my father had come down from Europe after not being able to find a job. And he had uh, been invited at some point on a boat that if in case he needed to look for another position, um, and that's what got my father eventually to the Philippines where he spent um, a, a number of years by himself. And at some point um, as, as a very involved individual uh, with the Jewish community, he was asked to uh, potentially go up to Manila and meet a woman and her mother who were coming to the Philippines. Um, and uh, my father took the job on and he went up to Manila. He was, he was living in Bacolod at the time. He met this woman and uh, the woman's uh, mother. Um, and uh, that was actually the, probably the most important meeting of uh, their lives because then uh, they produced me and uh -huh. they produced an older brother of mine that didn't make it through, unfortunately, and he produced my sister. Um, and in effect, you know, without that, I wouldn't be around. So strike one for the Philippines right there. Did they have uh, fond memories of, uh their stay in both Bacolod, I suppose, and Manila. Well, to some extent, they, they obviously did. They, you know, they wanted to start a family, but unfortunately, while they were in Bacolod, uh, and not too long after they were married, the war started. So that part of their stay in the Philippines, I think, was a, a, a profound lesson that yeah. uh, they both uh, were unfortunately uh, exposed to, but uh, after that, um, there was just only golden days for, for the both of them until my, my mother passed away. What is the most significant impact uh, of your family's history to you uh, and even the generations of your family to come? Well, I, I, I would probably think through this in terms of what impact it made uh, on my life, uh, aside from the fact that the, the, the Philippines contributed the opportunity for my parents to create me, okay, mm -hmm. was probably the end of the, 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 my mother's death and the, the being raised by uh, my, uh, my Filipina yaya, at the time, she arrived at our home while my mother was still alive, and she was 18 years old. From, from, the point of, from that point of time to the time when I was of adult age, she basically raised me. My father was very busy. He ran three businesses. He was very much involved with uh, the state of Israel at its birth. Um, he was a diplomat as well. And all along that period of time, as I grew up, I grew up with Lolita. So, as you can tell, probably the most impactful part of my life. Jack, uh, did, did you grow up um... In the Philippines, do you have any recollection of uh, life in the Philippines uh, when, you, when your family was here? Oh, I grew up in the Philippines, born and raised, finished mm -hmm. my, high school, my, my high school education, and then I moved to the States. And boy, do I have incredible memories of the Philippines. I mean, at one point, and I did, I actually came back 
to the Philippines after my excursions to the United States and living in France and living in, um, in, uh, in Germany, as well as in Switzerland. I came back and I worked in the Philippines for a number of years. Um, I watched how the Philippines had changed uh, at the time, from the time I grew up, the time and I came back. Um, it was a significant uh, buildup. The Philippines had changed completely. And it was, a, it was a blessing to see that the Filipinos really had the opportunity to shine. And they showed. Jack, I can tell that uh, your, your connection to the Philippines and your family's experience here has had a profound experience in your life. Um, do you think it affected your, the way you see the world and uh, how you are now as a person? I think the life in the Philippines offered me the opportunity to understand life in its true sense, not the Hollywood style of life, but the true difficult existence that people have. And I think it made the greatest impact in my life that allowed me to take what I learned and transmit it to my children and to my wife so that they could understand why they were who they were with me and where they could direct their lives as well in trying to really contribute as much as they can with their lives to people who do have needs. Mm -hmm. And I can only say that my wife does it as a teacher and she's done that for 38 years. My youngest daughter is very involved in the natural sciences. And my other daughter is very involved with the pharmaceutical industry in coming and to cre trying to create new products to save people. So the truth is they are the probably the shining light of what the Philippines has done for our family. Jack, if, yeah. if, I, if I may, you told me a story which really brought me to tears uh, recently. So the story that uh, Sunny is uh, indicating um, is that just last December and January, I took my kids uh, and my wife to the Philippines to, uh, to meet there and go out into the provinces. And um, my daughter as a scuba diver wanted very much to take my other daughter back into that uh, fold. So we all met in, um, well, I flew in with my wife and uh, then my uh, wife and I went down to Palawan and we spent some time there. And then my kids showed up and we ended up in um, Sikihor um, and then in Dawin. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, the first time that my kids at that age had an opportunity to see the Philippines and also get a sense of where my background came. They had been to the Philippines a number of times before. In fact, they both had the opportunity to meet the, my, my ex Yaya at the time but they were very young. So, uh, you know, the Philippines didn't really mean much to them, aside from the fact that they knew that I insisted and we obtained the Philippine passport for each of them so that they would remember where they really actually came from. And at some point, well, after we got back, I mean, my birthday was on May 17 and my daughter sent me a note. This, uh, this portion, she said, um, she says to me, thank you so much for taking us to the Philippines in January. It is such a beautiful place. And I had a lot of fun diving with you and 
my daughter, Ari. It was also very meaningful to me to be able to visit your childhood home with you and to bring Brandon, who was her husband, to a place that's very important and special to our family. I left feeling very proud to call myself a Filipina. And I, I am inspired by the people and potential that I saw there. Excuse me. It is beautiful. Jack, thank you so much for sharing something very personal to your family. And uh, I can see that um, uh, the impact of the Philippines has really transcended uh, generations of, of your family. Maybe one last question for me. Um, why do you think it's important during this time that we have a record number of refugees? At the end of last year, it was 79.5 million displaced around the world. Why do you think it's important for refugees and displaced communities to be able to tell their story? I think memories are very important in order to continue the knowledge of history. And I really feel that if you don't, and you know, to, to some extent, I didn't myself until Sonny actually showed me that I actually was a refugee. And because of that, I became so much more involved with Sonny because prior to that, I had no clue. My father never expressed that to me. My mother didn't mention it to me. Obviously, I was much too young at that point in time, but I actually never heard the story until Sonny came and explained to me that my mother was on the boat. Um, and because of that, it's an indication that shows you that if you who, if someone is themselves a refugee and doesn't know, anything about that what more those who have never seen or never experienced the the experience of being a refugee or have run in, encountered anyone who was a refugee they have no idea um, what it's like so the more stories that they run out and talk about and 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 hear the more they will be uh, hopefully open to accepting refugees at a time that they may be required to either accept or deny um, access. Um, and I think that's probably why it's so important um, to, to make, them, make people aware of the, uh, the, 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 the role of a refugee in our lives, because it really brings us to a level that we start questioning humanity. Thank you so much to, to Sunny, Dr. Sharon, and Jack uh, for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, thanks for being a, an ally of refugees and other displaced people around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And now we are joined by Kina, a historian and uh, a cultural heritage consultant. And of course, attorney Paulito C. De Jesus of the Department of Justice, RSPPU. Uh, maraming salamat guys for joining us. I want to talk about uh, the history of the Philippines when it comes to accepting refugees and also what we're doing currently to protect them. Um, I'll start with Kina. There's someone who has studied this part of our history thoroughly and understand that our history of refugees did not end nor start with the Jewish Holocaust refugees in the 1930s. Can you tell us about how the humanitarian legacy of the Philippines started? Thank you, Adam. Okay, um, I was listening to Jack's story and I was really moved. Um, and it is inspiring to us Filipinos to hear that we have this great humanitarian tradition. To answer your question, while we Filipinos um, are known to be a caring and compassionate people, 
we are known for our hospitality, um, our generous reception of guests, even strangers. And we see this in many aspects of our culture, from fiestas to our, how our Filipino frontliners today are taking care of patients. Our history basically has a lot of stories of this hospitality of the Filipinos that translates into humanity, especially when we receive strangers for humanitarian reasons. One of the earliest, if not the earliest, stories on the humanity of the Filipino is when our ancestors took in and showed humanity and compassion towards our first circumnavigators of the world. So that's Ferdinand Magellan and his sickly crew um, in 1521 when they first landed in Monon Island, which is now part of my hometown in Giwan. Our Filipino ancestors welcomed these foreigners with joy and seeing that they needed help, offered them food, water, and allowed them to stay on their shores to rest and recover. And even though Magellan and his crew were not technically refugees, but the reason I'm pointing this out is because the humanity shown by our ancestors to Magellan and his men is essentially similar to what we showed when we opened our doors to the nine waves of refugees 100 years later. This is actually um, um, celebrated next year in 2021 during the 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world, uh, along with the victory in Mactan. So there are other um, historical accounts, like for example, we have Don Musta Takayama and hundreds of Christians who fled to Manila in the 1500s because they were persecuted for their faith, religious faith in Japan. But what we consider as the first wave of refugees assisted by the Philippines were the Tsarist Russians or the White Russians who fled from the Bolsheviks in 1923 during the Russian Civil War. So these were the people who sailed from Vladivostok to Manila and many of them stayed here on in the Philippines. The second wave would be the subject of the documentary and that's the Jewish refugees fleeing from the Nazi persecution. And I would say that this specific episode has established or institutionalized our humanitarian tradition of opening our doors to refugees particularly. Kina, how did this history of um, accepting refugees and also the open door policy, how did that lay the groundwork for the country's succeeding efforts to help the displaced? Maybe one of the ways that we can appreciate more the significance of the open door policy, of Quezon's open door policy, is to look at it within the context of the nine waves of refugees. These stories sure showed us that we were open to strangers in need of refuge and assistance, but it was only during the Jewish wave, during the Quezon administration, when our country laid out policies that supported our giving of assistance and aid to the forcibly displaced. Quezon's open door policy was, um, I may say, proactive, and it would set the tone for how we as a country regarded and understood refugees and how we gave aid to refugees in the waves that would follow. As early as 1937, even Quezon issued presidential, presidential proclamations um, wherein he directed all branches of government to aid refugees. I think one of the most important and tangible impact of this open door policy is how it became a basis of the Immigration Act of 1940, particularly Section 47B. And this section is truly amazing and truly interesting for a refugee historian because Section 47B, and this was in 1940, before the 1951 Refugee Convention, 47B authorizes the president to admit refugees to our shores for humanitarian reasons, except, of course, when it is supposed to be public interest. So it means that in as early as 1940, we had a legal instrument to support our willingness, our openness to welcome refugees and give them protection. Another, I think another legacy or another impact is the spirit of, of this openness. So um, perhaps I, I, it's safe to say that Quezon set the trend of opening our doors to refugees who were fleeing from some of the world's worst and most ruthless conflicts and acts of persecutions in history, from Hitler, from General Franco, Mao Zedong, the Khmer Rouge, the Vietnam War. It's really inspiring to see that the Philippines had always opened its doors to those who were displaced by these major conflicts and how we showed solidarity with the world. I think that's one of the things that can make us proud to be Filipinos, how willing and open we were even before a larger consensus around the world. Um, of course, part of it, 
I suppose is uh, a legacy of our culture, but to flip the situation around, how do you think the nine waves of refugees impacted our culture as Filipinos? Well, I think it's easier to answer this at the local level because most of the waves of refugees were stationed in specific sites and localities. Like, for example, my particular research topic, the white Russians who were stationed in Tubabao in 1949, they taught the locals piano, ballet, music, and the arts. And we still have this legacy today. In fact, my piano teacher when I was young was a student of a Russian pianist. In Palawan, naman, you can find Vietnamese food. And the first wave of the white Russians who stayed in Manila built an Orthodox cathedral, which was bombed during World War II. So these are just examples of intangible and tangible heritage that these refugees left, some of the imprints of their stay in the Philippines. So even if these are not, how we would say, um, really impactful in terms of our culture as Filipinos, but I think the, the, the important point to raise here is the fact that these refugees brought value to the community. They had lasting contributions to us. Kasi diba sometimes people see them as a burden or pabigat. Others see them as nakakatakot or scary. But stories like these, how they share their culture, expand our understanding and increase our appreciation of refugees and even, I think, help fight um, xenophobia. Right. It makes our culture that much more rich, you know, uh, yes. having influx of people from from all around the world with their unique experience. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kina. Uh, this time, I'd like to shift our focus to the present and, of course, the future. Uh, Attorney Lito, how does this humanitarian legacy translate to the present day? And in a time when we are facing a record number of displacement around the world, what is the Philippines doing to respond to this global crisis in our own way? Uh, well, of, of course, as mentioned earlier, it was as early as you know, the 1900s where uh, we are opening our doors to people who are in need. Uh, in fact, uh, may I add that uh, we have a very early jurisprudence, which we actually study in law school, that deals with uh, refugees. Uh, in fact, they're white Russians. It's the most famous uh, Kukurichkin case wherein uh, the Supreme Court uh, basically recognized uh, stateless refugees. Now, also, uh, to add to this, uh, the uh, government, through the Department of Justice, uh, and of course our foreign affairs, we participated in the uh, 2019 high-level settlement on statelessness and in the Global Refugee Forum. We were in the Philippines made uh, several pledges in order to basically uplift the lives of our uh, refugees. The department have issued several circulars to implement our obligations under these refugee conventions, but the most important one is the one that was recently issued by the department in sometime in 2012, uh, Department Circular 1958, wherein uh, we have established the Refugees and Stateless Persons Protection Units. In 2015, uh, we established a national action plan to you know, uh, end statelessness. As part of the uh, collaborative effort uh, between the different government agencies, in the DOJ organized uh, a creation of an interagency steering committee wherein we actually grouped the numerous uh, agencies in order to you know, talk with each other so that we could provide the uh, uh, the necessary material assistance or services that our refugees need. In October 2017, the, we, we formalized the agreement for the protection of the refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless persons. On some policy and advocacy matters, we have passed a law establishing a national ID system. And once this is fully implemented, the refugees uh, can can have access to this uh, ID so that they will have you know ease of uh, should we say accessing the services that are being provided for by our government and uh, we also have this philippine development plan wherein stateless persons are included there and together with the other concerned stakeholders we have uh, drafted several bills in order for the refugees to have uh, easier 
a more facilitated access to be naturalized Filipinos. Now, on uh, durable solutions, uh, we are also offering skills training to, to our refugees. They are included in the job and technical, vocational, and educational training fairs that are regularly held uh, throughout the year. We are also uh, engaged with the other government agencies and sectors so for the self-reliance strategy. We believe, of course, that uh, once we make a refugee uh, fully capable of providing for himself, he can you know, be a productive member of our society. I would just also like to highlight some of the things that have been issued by our government agencies, which uh, we believe make things better for our refugees. For example, if they intend to work, they are actually exempted from uh, securing uh, an alien employment permit through our Department of Trade and Industry. We allow them to engage in the different industries and establish uh, companies that are open, uh, basically, to foreigners. And as part of our inclusive engagement, uh, since the government uh, cannot uh, basically do it alone, we need the help of uh, all of the members of society. So we are regularly in contact with our counterparts in the academy, and in particular the faith-based organizations, because they are very helpful in providing for basic needs uh, of our uh, refugees. There is also a Cities with Refugees campaign. By doing this, we are increasing the awareness of uh, other uh, government agencies, even local government units, in the plight of our refugees. And I guess that, that's it. Thank you so much, Attorney Lito. That was very comprehensive. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, quick question lang, Attorney. No? Uh, a lot of people in the Philippines are not really aware that uh, we do accept refugees and other stateless individuals. Um, can you give us an idea of how many actually apply for uh, the refugee status or asylum seekers in the Philippines in a given year? Uh, in a given year, uh, there are actually not that many. Uh, refugees or asylum applications, uh, maybe around hundreds or 200, maybe the most in any given year. It actually depends on what is happening uh, on other yeah. parts of the world. So if there are, you know, certain conflicts, etc., uh, you could expect that the numbers will increase. But we have, uh, you know, uh, as compared maybe to other countries who are hosting uh, thousands or even maybe millions of refugees. Uh, for the Philippines, at least uh, for now, we are accepting applications, uh, should we say, a uh, very manageable or uh, manner. What would you say is the biggest challenge that um, refugees or asylum seekers face in the Philippines if you were to identify the biggest hurdle to, uh, to their integration in our communities? Basically, whatever we encounter, whatever issues, problems we encounter, they also experience that. Of course, they need to earn a living, uh, need to provide for their needs, and basically to secure a good future for themselves and their families. In attaining this, uh, there are you know, challenges that they encounter, uh, which we try to pitch. Uh, for example, if they need the skills, we talk with our TESDA, once they have acquired the skills, they will be able to uh, work. But uh, through our interagency steering committee, IASC, uh, we refer their, the needed assistance of the refugees. So, for example, if uh, accessing the basic services from our local government units is uh, a challenge, but we try to communicate with our local government uh, counterparts so that they can talk to the local government units who are hosting these uh, refugees down to the barangay level. All right. Thank you so much, Attorney Lito and Kina. At this point, I'd like to welcome all of our panelists back into our chat room. And uh, we will be fielding some questions from social media because we are uh, tech savvy. We'd like to uh, bring in some of the people who have been following this conversation. Uh, shout out pala kay Joaquin Salazar. This is his question and it is, it is addressed to Sunny and Sharon. 
So Joaquin asks, how did Quezon's decision to take in Jewish refugees affect the international community's attitude towards taking in World War II asylum seekers? Uh, I'll start, Sharon, and you can follow up, please. Um, actually, unfortunately, it did not. Oh. <laughs> the, um, in, in, in 1938, July of 1938, there was a big worldwide conference that was uh, organized uh, to deal specifically with the question of Jewish refugees around the world. Uh, 35 uh, countries, a lot of the major powers, attended with the express intent of how to solve the Jewish refugee problem. Now, while this was going on, I'd like to point out that the Philippines already had an active rescue program, not just a passive opening our doors. No, they were actively recruiting refugees in Europe advertising in Jewish newspapers in Europe saying, you know, come here, we'll give you a job, we'll give you land, we'll even give you citizenship. So the Philippines was not just reactive, it was the first and to this day the only kind of an active refugee recruitment program that was going on in the world. And it's something that we Filipinos can be very, very proud of because we were the only nation doing it that has done it and the only nation since. The problem was that the Philippines was not a sovereign nation and did not have the ability to issue visas to the Philippine islands. That power was retained by the US government throughout the entire length of the Commonwealth period. And so even though Kassan was willing to bring in large numbers of Jewish refugees and offer them citizenship, he was not able to because they, they had to get the visas through consulates throughout Europe and the US State Department was quietly but really intransigently opposed to giving large numbers of Jewish refugees entrance to what was at the time legally an American territory. And there were officials in the US State Department who said that they were concerned that the, the Jews who came in through the Philippines would use the Philippines as a backdoor entrance, quote unquote, onto the American mainland. Right. So it was, uh, it was, it was really a tragic missed opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. And Sonny's right. The, the, Philippine willingness to offer a sanctuary to Jews from Europe did not have a significant impact on the, the family of nations, as they say. Really, nobody else stepped up to the plate. Uh, one of the things that, that I think is, is overlooked here is that Kesson said repeatedly that social justice was one of the constitutional planks of the Philippine nation. And he really put that, um, he put his money where his, where his mouth is. And he felt that, he said at one point that, that social justice worked best when it came about out of the sentiment of the heart and not the law on the books. That's not an exact quote, but that's, that's, just, that's the spirit of the quote. Essentially, what he was saying was that statecraft should be governed by a very simple and fundamental understanding of what doing what is right for everyone. Thank you, doctor. Um, we have another question from uh, Kendrick Miralles, who asks either Dr. Sharon or Kina, why were countries afraid to open their doors back then? I can, I can speak for the rest of the waves. Like for example, during the fifth wave, um, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why other countries were afraid to get the white Russians just because just during the Cold War, there was a, the Red Scare, like in America. Let me take a crack at it, Sharon, and then follow up, please. I think like, even during the time of Kazan, you know, there were those that were opposed, basically saying, look, you know, we're just coming out of a depression. You know, we, we have so many things on our plate. Do we really need to consider 
adding more to our burden. So it was a question of, do we have the bandwidth to be able to, to do this uh, properly? Uh, so there was those kinds of trepidations, uh, at least even you know, during that time. And I think even to today, uh, with a lot of countries, it has a lot to do with uh, people fearing that they, they may outstrip the resources they need for their own people kind of thing. Of course, there are those that are just prejudiced also that just do not want to, are and xenophobic and do not want to open their countries other to their own kind. Yeah, I think there, there are two factors that made countries very unwilling to take in any significant numbers of Jewish refugees. One of them was simply global anti-Semitism. And I mean, no countries really wanted to take in large numbers of Jewish refugees. I think the second factor that prevented other countries from accepting significant numbers of Jewish refugees is the fact that the Nazi regime systematically and progressively impoverished Jews who were still in Europe. And so what you end up with is large numbers of people who are desperate to get anywhere, but they are not allowed to bring their, their money, their assets, they had to sell their houses, their businesses failed. And so by, by creating a, a whole cohort of, of not only desperate, but impoverished refugees, that made it additionally difficult for, for uh, would-be refugees to, to get visas anywhere. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have limited time. You have a lot of questions here. Um, but at this point, I'd like to ask all of our panelists to give us your parting words. And from your own perspective, how can we each contribute in making a difference as we face these unprecedented challenges in the world? Um, perhaps we can start with Sunny. Okay. Um, I would like to suggest that we follow the Philippines model and as an example. The Philippines was not reactive. It was proactive. It saw a problem and came up with a solution and was, didn't have to be asked. You know, when, when President Quezon first heard of the Jewish uh, refugee issue, he said, what do we need? A million visas? We can make that happen. We have the resources, we have the land, we, we, we can you know, get them jobs. So it's, it's unfortunate that the numbers get, get getting chopped smaller and smaller. So we wound up with the 1,305, whose descendants, by the way, number over 11,000 today which is a lot of souls. Hopefully, when confronted with situations like this, we don't just react. We go ahead and act in a proactive way so that we're not just thinking about a mendicant kind of solution, but a solution that provides both a home and a heart for the people that come here. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, can, we now, can we now hear from Dr. Sharon? Sunny's father was a political cartoonist, did a political cartoon about people trying to come into the Philippines, and it was this high Suwali wall, and it was bending under the pressure of hordes and hordes of people who were trying to get through a very narrow gate. And the caption above it was, will it hold? And it is referring to the, the, the negotiations that were going on at the time about the institution of a new immigration bill, which would end up being the Immigration Act of 1940. And that image, it makes me think immediately of the, the news story that was going on before COVID hit of the uh, Colombian and other South American refugees who were walking, liter quite literally, thousands of miles northward 
and were trying to get to the US and then got stopped <laughs> in Mexico. Families were separated, children were put in chain link cages. Um, it was a scandalous and egregious defamation of human dignity. Mm. And I think that the the story of the Maniliners shows how countries can in fact take in people. They may be desperate, they may be impoverished, they may be not what the country is looking for particularly in terms of immigrants, and yet they can become part of the Tapo, they can become part of the nation and part of the people. We need to follow our conscience. And I think that's what the story of the Maniliners shows. Thank you, Sharon. Um, let's go to Attorney Lito first. Part of our uh, duties as a humanitarian country, we are the torchbearer when it comes to fulfilling our obligations under the refugee conventions. And of course, uh, as the torchbearer, we would ensure that you know our policies, our rules, regulations, will be geared towards the attainment of uh, providing the necessary services and support to our refugees. And because we believe that they can be productive members of society, so we just need to tap them uh, because they are an asset to, the, uh, to any country, if you may. And on a personal note, you know, I, I believe that there's a saying if I'm not mistaken, that there are small roles, but only small actors. So in my own little way, as a senior protection officer in the Department of Justice, I try to put myself into their shoes. They are here because uh, they are in need of protection. So that uh, in my own little way, I am actually advocating for the you know, giving of the necessary uh, protection to our refugees. And if you could just imagine, in a foreign country, you are forced uh, by things beyond your control to be a refugee in that country. You don't have any, you know, family. You don't have relatives. You don't even have a friend that can give you support. So wouldn't it be a nice feeling to know that you have uh, a friend whom you can rely on in the government? I guess that's the kind of welcome that uh, we should extend to our refugees who are sojourning for the time being, as they say. Uh, as part also of our development agenda, leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Attorney Lito. Uh, Jack, please hang tight. We'll save you for last. I'd like to go to Kina first. Uh, Kina, can you share with us your parking words? When I began my research on the fifth wave, not many people knew about it. And as Dr. Sharon mentioned earlier, nobody really knew about these stories of refugees in the Philippines. So I think our contribution in history, among other things, is to continue digging up, documenting, sharing these kinds of stories of refugee assistance to, I guess, inform and, and inspire the present and the future. For me, um, I think it's important to keep telling these kinds of stories, not only because we can learn so much from the past, but when we're talking about refugees, awareness fosters understanding and understanding fights fear. And fear is one of the things that I think make the lives of refugees harder. So, for example, when we fear people, right? we tend to close our doors. We even lock our doors when we fear people. But when we understand that it's okay, that's what we've done before, that opening our doors is possible, then things start to change. When knowledge breaks barriers and these things change the mindset of people, these are huge things to refugees. And since refugees are the most vulnerable in these difficult times, these kind of these kinds of stories are are ways to open our hearts and minds, to nurture empathy, to nurture solidarity for the plight of refugees, which they need now more than ever. Thank you, Kina. And finally, Jack. Well, this is my my goodbye for the evening. Um, I think Kina took everything that was from my heart and actually expressed it. I think the only way I could express myself is probably from my appreciation uh, for what 
I experienced, and although it might seem to be uh, comical, it is absolutely a very true statement. I have told this to many people, and I've said it in a way for them to understand that if you want to have the nature that the Philippines has shown in the past, I think that the world should immigrate as many Filipinos to come to their particular countries and they will show them the way because they're the only people that stood out ever and has done something for somebody or some people who they had no reason to help. And for people to understand that, it's really difficult. So you got to see it in action and learn how to be kind and generous and willing to take in things that they may not know much about, but are willing to take the chance. And that's it. We are so grateful for our uh, panelists uh, this evening. Maraming salamat to uh, Attorney Lito, to Kina, to Jack, and of course, Sharon and Sunny. Thank you so much for standing with refugees. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And to cap off tonight's insightful discussion, we also have one of the last surviving Manilaners, Lottie Hirschfield, to share a few words for our audience. Well, my name is Lottie Hirschfield, and I am 89 years old. I will soon be 90 years old. I would not be sitting here talking with you if it had not been for, for the Filipinos. I was born in Germany. I was saved during the Holocaust by the Filipino people. And I came to the Philippines when I was seven. Filipinos are very, very sweet, very gentle, very welcoming people. And um, they were exceedingly kind to us. And uh, we became great friends. I was 15 when I left and I didn't want to leave because that was the only, basically the only home that I ever had. And I still have my Filipino bakyas. I still have some of my Filipino dishes. And uh, this will always, always, this is, this is part of our lives. To this day, we've been grateful to the fact that otherwise we would not be here if it had not been for President Quezon and for the people of the Philippines. Uh, unfortunately, not enough know about it. The people that are my generation and the people that are just a bit younger know, but the young people do not know, and they really should know what their country did. The, it is a story that is not well known and it's important that uh, it be distributed to everyone. Well, I feel that refugees many times build, help build a country. And of course, you are saving lives by admitting refugees. And there's a, an old Jewish saying from the writings in the Jewish Talmud that says, if you save one life, you have saved the world. It is, it is very, very important uh, to have that feeling of human, of, of humaneness. That is, uh, that is what we can learn. Thank you. And again, salamat po, salamat po. Give my best to all of Manila, all of the Philippines. And to all the carabaos.
So it's my fourth World Refugee Day commemoration, and each year I see exponential numbers of displacement. It's intimidating, it's glaring, and a hard truth that might feel too big for regular people like you and me. World Refugee Day 2020 is happening against the backdrop of the COVID-19 crisis and global protests demanding an end to social injustices in all of its forms. The coronavirus pandemic has reminded us how interconnected we all are and the importance of leaving no one behind. Asylum seekers and refugees are particularly vulnerable to racist and xenophobic attitudes and acts. For some, like Lottie and Jack's family, racism and discrimination are the very reasons why they were forced to flee their homes. With the recent mobilizations against racism and discrimination, World Refugee Day 2020 is an opportunity to appeal for greater inclusion and for equal rights. UNHCR stays and delivers. Our teams continue to serve where they are needed most while adjusting to the way we operate to the COVID-19 reality. UNHCR and its partners will continue to support governments in their efforts as well but we need help to continue saving lives. Whether it's the fight against COVID-19 or the fight to end racism, everyone has a role to play. And it doesn't have to be big grand acts. It can begin with starting a discussion with our families and communities about our humanitarian tradition and the need to stand with refugees and the forcibly displaced. This virus doesn't discriminate, meaning it can affect anyone. However, those forcibly displaced are exposed and they often live in crowded and substandard conditions, lacking basic services, including access to clean water, basic sanitation, or health facilities. So while the COVID-19 makes all of us vulnerable, we have come to realize that our strength as a human community lies in our ability to pull together and help those in need and also call for an end to all forms of discrimination. Maraming salamat po.